Hi, this is Jeff Nupp, and welcome to the third video in the Writing Idiomatic Python video series. In the second video, we took a look at an HTTP proxy script uh, and began the process of refactoring it. So today, in this video, what we'd like to do is really get into the meat of the refactoring. The previous video uh, was a lot more format and uh, convention-related changes. But today we want to get into uh, much more implementation specific changes. So uh, I've created a new Git repository for the third video um, and I'll share that on the YouTube comments. Um, but first thing, I have uh, three files here. Um, proxy2 is where we left off. Um, proxy.py is the file we'll be working on, which at the moment is just a copy of proxy2. And proxy orig is the original script before we even made the changes in the second video. So we'll start by opening up the proxy.py. Um, uh, that just opened in a different screen. Okay, so here we are. Um, so this should look familiar. Uh, if I just scroll down here, we can see the changes that we made um, and what we still have is, uh, you know, the, the same structure and, and basically implementation as the original one. Uh, it was, it's just cleaned up and looks a bit nicer. So the first thing I'll do, as usual, is save the file, run my um, linters and, and PEPA checkers, uh, and see that everything is okay. So I saved it, uh, scrolling down, yeah, no, we don't get any errors, so everything is fine formatting-wise and uh, basic uh, errors-wise. Um, so it's important now that we go through and just understand how the proxy is actually implemented. Um, and it's, it's very simple, and for those who are unfamiliar, a proxy is a server that sits between you and another server that you'd ultimately like to connect to and really just uh, shuttles the traffic back and forth. So uh, it accepts a connection from you, it makes a connection to the server that you're going to connect to, um, and then it listens for data from you. When it gets that, it just sends it to the final destination. It then listens for data from the final destination. When it gets that, it sends it back to you. So um, that's how an HTTP proxy works. Um, they're usually, uh, they usually have a lot more logic in them. They're used for things like blacklisting websites, um, you know, checking or, or recording, um, say employees, web browsing, um, things like that. Uh, ours really doesn't have any logic. It doesn't do anything with the data that flows through it. It just, you know, acts as a kind of a shell around uh, a real proxy. If you wanted to write a real one, this is a good way to start. Okay, so that's what an HTTP proxy does. Um, now that we know that, let's take a look at the implementation. So the main class, the only class, uh, is this connection handler class. Um, and as we said, it handles the connection between the client and server. Um, so for that reason, it has two connections and um, a, a one buffer. So. The, the buffer is for data coming in from the client. Uh, the connections are a connection to the client and a connection to the remote host. Um, and that's basically it. Um, this timeout parameter is rather silly, as we'll see later. Not silly, but it doesn't work as you might expect. Um, and everything else is, is pretty straightforward. So let's go through what actually happens when this object is created. Actually, let's jump down to main. Um, 
or start server and look at um, how the the script starts up so the, the first thing you might notice is the if name equals main um, on line 119 and you know that's always good to have that's an idiom in the book um, it allows you to write reusable code so this code could be imported in another module uh, and we wouldn't have any problems with it just starting on its own without us wanting it to um, but you'll notice that there's a call to start server with no arguments and start server actually takes um, was it one two three, four, five parameters so it's kind of silly because there's no way for the user to influence that um, and given that we have one of two options we can um, add some command line arguments that the user can pass in to affect these values or we can just keep them as they are but not make them parameters to the function um, and just have them as variables that are declared right after right after the definition of the function um, and while the former might seem like the quote right approach um, it's really not necessary to let the user um, to let the user specify host and port and uh, timeout and certainly not the handler class um, I think that it, 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 whoever is going to be using this is definitely going to be capable of going in and making a one-line change if they want to um, serve on a different port or something like that so the first thing we'll do is <clears throat> remove all these and then we have to say host equals localhost port equals 8080 um, the timeout we will set for now but we're gonna get rid of that in a little bit and you'll see why um, but for now we'll, we'll keep it here um, the handler class is, is certainly not necessary but um, we can just hard code that into there um, and as far as IP version 6 versus IP version 4 um, again since we don't have the user passing in command line arguments um, I'm just going to take out the IP version 6 support. It would be easy to allow the user to uh, choose between the two, but um, in the interest of keeping things simple, I will just um, always do IP version 4. So um, now this suck type, which was for IP version 4, um, we know that's always going to be the case so we can get rid of this and just write socket dot afinet <clears throat> um, okay and this w w should work um, th this change shouldn't have broken anything let's uh, confirm that by actually running it okay um, now on another terminal let's just make sure that I have my proxy set I do so I'm going to use HTTP and go to google.com and it works so I'll stop it uh, and we can go back to the code um, one thing I don't really like is you know and and there is mention in PEP8 is uh, the use of abbreviations for no reason and we saw a lot of that in the second video where you know we're saving a couple keystrokes in naming variables but all it does is add confusion and cognitive burden to the reader so really that you know if there's not a overwhelming 
need to use an abbreviation in variable naming. Uh, I just don't do it. So uh, this was probably named sock instead of socket because of the socket library. Um, you know, you don't want to clobber the name there. So we can just call this something completely different. Uh, let's just call it listener. Okay, so listener. And make the change here as well. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Vim, um, one thing you can do is, so you can uh, replace an, just a, a single word, which is what I did, and then by pressing the period key, um, every other time you see the word you wanted to replace, um, it will make this this it will do the last action that that you did, which was changing the word. So, in our case, it changed sock to listener. Now, another way I could have done that, just you know, for everyone's edification, is if you look down at the bottom of the screen, uh, down here, I can do um, said like um, substitutions. So I can just say sock um, and listener. Now, why is this not going to be a good idea? Well, because sock is a prefix of socket. So it's going to change all of those things as well. So that's why I did it um, the way that I did. Um, so let's go back to the listener. Uh, and that was G undo for anyone who was wondering what just happened. So um, when I toggle G undo, um, it shows a tree of revisions basically so every time you make a change it uh, takes a snapshot and then it creates branches if you do something then later go back and undo it and do something else so you know I was able to go back to the portion where we had named everything listener by going to the tip of this branch, which will now become um, the head or, or whatever you would want to call it. So G undo is really a useful tool. Um, that you can, There are other ways to interact with the undo tree it, directly within Vim, but G undo makes it a hell of a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now we have listener replaced sock um, and here is the construct that I talked about in video two that uh, is a little too cute for me. So what it's doing is um, starting a new thread and connection handler is the target. Um, so the init method of connection handler and the arguments are this. So well, let's actually break this down um, and see what that means. So the first thing we have is listener.accept. Now listener.accept returns a tuple of connection and address. So connection is the actual connection uh, that was accepted, the socket connection. Address is the address of where the connection originated. So it returns this tuple. Now plus timeout comma concatenates the two. Um, and so what we effectively have is the following. Uh, which are, if we look at connection handler, those are the, th the three uh, arguments that are passed in. The, the one of which we don't even use. The, the um, address. So, like I said, it, it's all a little too cute for me, and it's certainly not obvious just by looking at it what's actually going on. Um, you, you have to kind of think about it for a second and say, oh, okay, I see what he's doing there. Um, so we're going to make this much simpler and more clear. 
Um, you'll notice that this is using the thread package. Um, one thing that Python has in a number of places is low-level libraries for when you really need to get low-level, but then higher-level abstractions. Um, and the thread and threading packages are a good example of that. So thread is uh, low level. It gives you lower level access and more fine grained control, control over the creation of threads. Um, threading is a higher level package uh, and is really, it really has much more convenient uh, uh, sets of functions and classes. So for example, in threading there is a thread um, class um, and the thread class uh, takes a target which is you know the function or whatever that will be called when the thread is run and then it just has a run method uh, and, and join and, and things like that um, but it's uh, a class based thread I guess threading approach um, that's really much simpler to you so let's use that instead just so we can make all of this a bit more clear so rather than doing the accept in um, the actual call and this is another thing that isn't obvious until you think about how it's working you might look at this while loop and and say well clearly we're just going to sit here and spawn threads over and over again right because it's a while one with only a, a single line so you know it's going to start a thread and then go back to the while loop start another thread and you know we're just going to start threads forever well the reason that doesn't happen is because of the accept call so this is a blocking call um, that won't return until we actually get a connection so what actually happens is it starts a thread on each new connection and if you remember um, the class uh, basically f runs everything from the init method and then shuts down the connections and is done so uh, really what's happening is you get the accept uh, create the connection handler instance and then handle the connection to and from the client and server and then you're done and then back in the main thread it has already gone to the next accept uh, call and is waiting for another new connection so again really not unobvious from just kind of glancing at it so let's make this a lot more clear what we'll do is say connection address equals listener dot accept so we'll make the accept much more explicit um, and let's just print out when we get a connection and where it's from uh, then this we can get rid of and change it to threading dot thread so it, it takes as a keyword argument ta the target uh, in our case it's connection handler um, and the arguments uh, so let's go back and look well now we can take out this silly argument that wasn't being used um, and we just have connection and timeout so args are connection and timeout and then we'll call dot run on it um, and that should be it so let's just fix the fact that this is longer than 80 characters there we go okay so what we've done now is um, I guess in spirit it's the same as what was happening before but the way it's doing it is much more clear um, you know we we've made the fact that this is blocking on an accept uh, explicit and didn't uh, it's not no longer hidden in the um, 
function parameter or the uh, the arguments um, and we're also using the thread class uh, to be able to get a, a, a bit more finer grain control over that um, in specifically in this case we we may not need it but if you're given the choice between using the low level interface and the high level interface um, and you could use either I would always choose the high level interface because if you need to make changes that's going to be the one you want to work with if you can so um, again not a, not a real functional change here but it, it lays the groundwork for more sophisticated um, threading operations done at a higher level so we need to see um, that we haven't broken anything yet and uh, to do that we'll actually run the script again so let me just save it and now we'll go test it out so let's run the uh, proxy Okay, so we see it's serving on localhost 8080, and then I want to go to google.com again, and yeah, it looks like it worked. So um, let's just run it again to make sure that multiple calls work, and yeah, it, it, it does. Uh, so we'll stop it and go back to the code. Um, one thing that we would do... Um, but I'm not going to right now in the interest of time is write a simple unit test for this uh, to be able to test it um, and make sure that we didn't break functionality without having to actually run the proxy. Um, you know, th that's the kind of thing where it's really con it makes it much more convenient for you wh while you're developing um, to be able to make sure you haven't made any broken changes breaking changes and that's especially true during refactoring so when you're really not trying to change functionality you're, you're just trying to change the structure of the code um, <clears throat> okay so uh, there we have um, our uh, uh, start server which uh, looks quite a bit different than the original one but I think this is much more clear and, and makes more sense um, one thing that uh, I think is a bit silly is the name of the class connection handler um, it really uh, do, like uh, c connection handler is, is a very vague term so uh, I want to rename the class and I, I'm actually going to just rename it exactly what it is which is a proxy so I'll make that change and that's more of a cosmetic change but you know it's important to um, come up with appropriate names for things because that's the way that you're speaking to the people the person that's reading your code um, good variable names is really one of the things that novices struggle with the most um, coming up with names that are appropriate and descriptive and not too long um, or on, on the other on the other hand uh, not just single character names or you know three letter names um, those are, are not useful for the opposite reason which is it's too little information um, uh, you know, I, I think it was new, one of those famous new quotes that um, there, you know, there are two hard problems in computer science, um, caching and uh, naming variables or naming things rather. So it, it definitely is, you know, that's tongue in cheek, but it, it's definitely something that uh, can be difficult if you don't give it some thought. Okay, so we finished the start server method, um, or function rather, uh, and now we'll go back and look at the actual implementation of the class methods. Um, notice that we were able to get rid of that, um, the argument that was unused, uh, but we still have the connection and the timeout. So 
looking down here, this all looks fine. Um, I don't see anything in the init method that we cleaned it up a bit in the second video, but I don't see anything that needs more cleanup. Uh, so let's go to the next method, get base header. So the the purpose of this function, get base header, is when you send an HTTP request, it's in the form of uh, something like this. It'll look like get slash HTTP 1.1. So, and then down here, we're going to have headers like except star, whatever, you know, so there are a bunch of headers um, that follow. But what we want from, what this function does is given this entire string, so headers and all, uh, it just returns the first three, um, th these three pieces of data as separate variables. So uh, uh, this is the HTTP method the get right here. The path is slash. So if I wanted to go to google.com, the path would be slash. If I wanted to go to google.com slash foo slash bar, it would be foo slash bar. Um, and then the version is the version of the HTTP protocol that we're using, which um, the, the latest is 1.1. .1. 2 is in the works, but it, that's not um, not available. Uh, so how do we do this uh, in a way that is clear to the reader what we're doing and, and that it is actually correct? So let's look at um, the original implementation. So there's a while loop and it says while the client buffer, I'm sorry, um, set the client buffer, append to the client buffer uh, the data that we receive from the socket and keep doing so until it finds a new line character. And once it finds a new line character, then we know that everything after the new line is um, kind of the, the data that we want to send. Everything before the new line is the data that we are interested in returning from the function. So the method, path, and protocol. Um, and here you can see it's using uh, list slicing to say that the data is everything from um, after the character, after the new line, um, dot split why is it doing dot split um, oh I'm sorry data is what's returned yeah that makes sense okay so it's everything up to the new line rather and splitting it um, so that's the method path and protocol because those are the three things before the new line um, and then it sets the client buffer, so the rest of the data, we'll call it, um, to everything from the character after the new line on to the end, and then it returns the data. Um, so is there an easier or better way to do this? Well, when we look at it at this, um, let's just notice for a second because um, it'll be useful once we're done, that this is, so, uh, nine lines long. Um, and that's fine, you know, it's, it's not a very large function, but uh, when I read this, at least, the first time, it's not entirely clear w what is going on and what the purpose of everything is. So, you know, the first time I read this, I had to stare at it for a second um, to see what was actually being done. And I think the reason for that is there are Python built-ins that could have been used here that weren't. 
Um, and that's always confusing to me when I'm reading code. Uh, if I see a spot where a built-in function or um, package could have been used and wasn't, it makes me suspicious about you know what's going on in the code and is there some kind of trick there. Um, so it, one of the idioms in the book is to know the contents of the standard library and you know that comes into play here I think and you'll see why in a sec but if we were to rewrite this and try to make it cleaner what we could say is what we're really doing is we're calling receive and adding to the client buffer until we find a new line in the uh, data so instead of this while one which is is never really descriptive and and always something i would avoid if possible um, we can say while the um, new line character is not in self dot client buffer just uh, append Keep, keep appending until we get a new line character. And that's what we were trying to do before, right? Um, now, the, the one thing we've lost now is the um, position of the new line once we do find it, right? That's what, if I go and undo, um, that's what was being calculated as well in the while loop. But it turns out that th th the operation that's being done here is a very, very common one. So um, you have a string and a sentinel value, in our case, the new line, and you want to split it into everything before that and everything after that, um, which is exactly what's being done here. And there exists, you know, obviously because it's so common an operation, there exists a string function to do exactly that, and it's called string.partition. So um, I'm going to just delete these two lines um, and delete this line as well. Um, and so the easiest way to see how partition works is well, it returns. Uh, a tuple of three um, elements. The, the first element is everything before the sentinel value. The second element is actually the sentinel value itself, uh, which isn't always useful, so a lot of times you'll see the underscore there. And the third value, the third element is everything after the sentinel value. Um, so what we can say here is data underscore self dot client buffer equals self dot client buffer dot partition and you can see in my autocomplete up here um, given the separator it returns the tuple head separator tail um, so we're going to then partition on oops the new line character. Um, and why is it safe for us to do this? What if the new line character isn't in there? Well, we know it is because we checked on line 31. So it's perfectly safe to do this partition. Um, now, the only thing that we have to do, the only other thing that we have to do is um, call split on data because data is currently just the string, uh, like get slash HTTP slash 1.1 all as a single string. We want to split that um, at the spaces and return a list, uh, essentially, of the um, those three. So now we're going to return, now we're returning exactly what we said we would, the method, path, and protocol. Um, we did take out a print statement, which was kind of extraneous anyway. Uh, we could certainly um, put that back in if we wanted to. So you can see that the print statement um, did uh, 
the it printed the client buffer um, from well it, it printed the client the the data that we were going to return basically um, not split just as a single string so of course we could do that as well by simply saying print data here um, but uh, if, whether or not that's necessary is really up to you I'm gonna leave it out just because I, I don't think it's um, wholly necessary to show you know what the address or the what path and method were is being used when we get a connection okay uh, moving on we'll check the method connect um, this you know it's four lines uh, I really have no problem with it we already changed to use the string dot format um, so what it's doing is first it's connecting to the destination uh, server using the info from the path variable that's passed in um, it's sending this connection string basically so when you do HTTP connect which is um, not very common it's used for tunneling um, over HTTP so um, you could do things like SSH over HTTP using HTTP dot or HTTP connect um, so it has to send this string in a specific format um, and then it just calls uh, the read write function which is the main um, communication shuttling function so method connect I think is fine I don't think we need to really make any changes here uh, let's go down to method others so this is for all other HTTP methods um, and this function um, you'll notice two things one um, it's got an opportunity again to use string partitioning it's it's really the perfect candidate for string partitioning um, and the second is um, this line 48 path equals path 7 colon uh, you know what in the world does that mean uh, you really have to think about it to realize that what this is doing is it's stripping off the the portion of the string HTTP colon slash slash uh, to be able to find the server to connect to um, so that's not at all clear from line 48 a way to make that clear is to say um, path equals path from len http colon slash slash onward right so this is, is functionally equivalent but now it's much more clear what we're doing we're trying to strip off the http colon slash slash part um, that you know that's a very simple change but in terms of its impact on the clarity of the code it's huge um, so the next three lines are again doing this find a sentinel value set something to everything before it set something to everything after it uh, and like we saw before we can use string partitioning to do that rather than uh, list slicing with indices so let's just delete these lines and we can say um, host path equals path by partition slash okay um, then the next thing we do is um, connect to the target host now one slight subtlety uh, in the previous code and I'll undo my change just so you can see it is that this um, 
the index is where it found the first slash. So if we're thinking about what path is, an example of value for path would be that, um, or better, that. Um, so the first thing we do on line 49 is we delete this part. Then what the original code does is it says that host is everything up to here, but not including. So remember how list slicing works with the indices. And path is everything from here, including the slash, to the end. So it's really separated it into uh, host and path. Now, if I go back to what we had, what we see is that path is everything after the slash, but doesn't include the slash. The slash is in this empty variable. So what we have to do to make it work the same as the original code is just add the slash. So we could say path equals format path, and that adds the slash. Um, so that's you know something kind of subtle that uh, we would have it caught me the first time, um, and luckily you know it's something that's easier to fix, but it's very subtle. Um, looking at the rest of this, uh, you know it calls this connect target method um, and then sends the HTTP request um, and. If you've never seen it before, this is how you send an HTTP request in raw string form. You send the method, space, the path, space, the protocol. Um, then you send a new line, and um, basically everything after is HTTP headers followed, and at the very end are, I think, two new lines. Um, so we're sending everything that we wanted to send. We set the client buffer equal to nothing because we just sent the client buffer. And then we call read write. Um, and that's uh, basically it. And, and that looks fine to me. The rest of this here looks fine to me. Um, so let's move on to connect target. Um, first, uh, right off the bat, connect target as a name doesn't sound descriptive to me. And the reason it doesn't is because it sounds like it's connecting the target to something else, when in fact we are connecting to the target. So just by adding the word to here, I can make it much more clear uh, what's actually going on. So I'm going to change all of these to connect to target. So now if we go back and look at method others, the, the previous uh, method we were looking at, we see it does the host and path manipulation, and then it calls connect to target. Now to me, that's much more clear than connect target. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's one of those subtle things that you just kind of get a feel for uh, as you go. Um, and you know, it's it's kind of on the borderline of whether or not you would make the change. I would always make that change. Some people wouldn't, and that's fine. But, it, you know, you should at least have a reason why or why not. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, you should think about and have an opinion on. Okay, so starting from line 62, um, we see that yet again... Uh, we're, we're doing slicing of um, a string for looking for a sentinel and setting something equal to everything before it, everything after it. This is getting, you know, very repetitive. Um, so 
what host is currently set to is something like this or alternately um, something like let's say let's say I'm testing a flask application so it could include the, a colon in the port or it doesn't include it and it's just a normal request to the HTTP server so if it doesn't include the port this is effectively the same as this um, it's always assumed that well it's well known that 80 is the port for HTTP traffic so if there is no port specified it's assumed to be 80 um, so rather than make that known down here uh, what we can do is just say port equals 80 so we'll go with the assumption that port equals 80 and then this host.find um, the you know the the much nicer way to do it uh, since we're going to use partition is if the colon is in host and this should be very familiar host point equals host partition on the colon okay um, we can get rid of the else now uh, and we have uh, a much clearer way in only three lines um, of getting the host import information um, so the next three lines are really just you know necessary and there's there's not really much that um, we can do here I would change sock family to socket family just because you know three line uh, three letters are we're not being charged by the number of characters in our file so uh, I think we're fine there um, and then everything else looks good um, so we're at a point now where we should probably test it again just to make sure we haven't broken anything um, and we'll do that now start the proxy it at least starts all right uh, connect to Google yep and twice yeah okay so we still haven't broken anything and now we have this nice message about getting a connection from the local host uh, so I'll stop that and we'll go back and now we've come to the the final um, method in the class and this is really you know the most important it's the one where data is being shuttled back and forth from the client to the server um, so if we look at how it works it first creates a list of two sockets and uses this count variable um, it sets it to zero it does the while one which I um, don't like but that's you know sometimes you have to use it and it increments count so then it calls select on the sockets um, so if you recall select takes three optionally four arguments the first is all the sockets that we want to wait on for readable events the second is the list of sockets that we want to wait on for writable events uh, or to be notified when it is writable the third is to be notified when there's an error on one of the sockets and the fourth is the timeout um, so the way this works is it this blocks until <clears throat> either there is data to receive or there's an error if there is an error it just breaks out of the while loop and finishes basically and that's the end of uh, everything otherwise um, if receive is not null or is not the empty list that means there is a socket for which there is data to be received and it says um, and it, there could be multiple sockets um, so it, multiple being client and target self.client and self.target but uh, so we iterate over them and we get the data 
uh, by doing in dot receive, um, which grabs buffer length amount of data. And then we have to figure out the data that we received, who did it come from, so we can figure out who to send it to. So if the in underscore was self dot client, then the person was, or the target to send to is self dot target. So self.target remember is the uh, remote web server self.client is the client sending the request otherwise it's the opposite we got data from the web server and, and we need to send it to the client so then assuming there is data it just writes the data to out um, and sets this count variable to zero so what we need to determine is what does count do um, the last line here is if count equals equals timeout max break um, so what's happening here is count is being set to for some reason that I still don't understand uh, self dot timeout divided by three if you remember self dot timeout was hard coded to 60 so timeout max is set to 20 um, and self.timeout itself is never directly used. Um, we can see the only places that it's referenced are in the init method and here. So the fact that we divide it by three is uh, somewhat silly. Um, but regardless, what happens is each time through the loop, we increment count. Now, if we successfully receive data, um, then we reset count to zero. So that means that you know we've received data in this select loop, um, and that um, there there is likely more for us to receive. If we go through this loop 20 times and count is never set back to zero then we assume that the client and server are done sending data to one another and we can simply close the connection so it's the count is being used as a way to determine how many times have we been through the loop without um, actually receiving any data from select um, so that's what this whole uh, method is doing. So, I mean, we just, I said before that the timeout is somewhat extraneous and here is, is where I hope you see why. Um, so I'm actually gonna get rid of timeout max and self.timeout. Um, and I'm going to get rid of timeout everywhere we see it. So no more timeout. Let's just make things easier. Um, now we have to deal with uh, count uh, and how we're going to do that. But it turns out we don't actually really need count. Um, what we can do instead is just go through the loop and I'm going to remove all references to count just go through the loop and let's set the timeout here to 10 seconds um, so if we don't receive anything in 10 seconds um, or we receive an error then break otherwise um, if we receive, if the if there is a socket that is readable, um, we do this. So one thing I want to change is this in underscore. It's just a, a really poor name for a variable. So the in underscore and out without an underscore. Um, and I don't know why. Um, I mean, I know that he couldn't have the original author couldn't have named it in without the underscore because that's a reserved word uh, but 
still, then I would have chosen another pair of words. And let's do that. So let's just call it source and destination. So source, destination, I missed one. Okay, source and destination now. So we still iterate over it, um, and we still set the data to um, receive, but this time we're going to say, if not data, just return. So if there is no, if, if we get a readable socket with no data to actually read, uh, just return from the function. So one thing to notice is that if we just return here, um, it's going to cause an issue. And that that issue is the fact that uh, we never get to close self.client and self.target. Um, we're going to handle that in a sec, but for now, let's just finish off the uh, loop here. So if not data return, um, and this if source is client else, that's fine. We're, we're definitely going to keep that. Uh, we no longer need this if statement. Um, and this can uh, be moved. But more importantly, um, this uses socket.send uh, on destination.send, you know, where it says destination.send. Um, and .send is a function that sends data to the destination socket but it may not send all of the data. It may require multiple calls to send uh, to send all of the data. Um, and that's not really what we want here. What we want instead is to block in s until we know we have sent all of the data or until some sort of error occurs. So luckily there is a socket function, another socket function that's very similar to send called send all. Um, and we'll use send all to just sit and wait until we have sent all of the data um, or an error occurs and then continue. So like I said earlier, there, the problem with this is that if we return when there's not data, uh, we never close the sockets. And in fact, it, the problem is a bit more insidious than that. If any of these calls throws an exception, then the sockets never get closed, right? So one thing that would be nice would be to use a context manager um, for the sockets. Uh, but short of doing something like that, the easiest way to make sure that they get closed is to wrap this all on a try block. Um, so we'll just wrap that in a try, and then this becomes finally close these. So now we're guaranteed that even if this return statement, even when this return statement is hit, um, we will close self.client and self.target. Um, one last uh, kind of cosmetic change is, um, clearly I don't like the name, socks. Uh, um, again, the, the original author really had something with saving three characters for every variable name, but let's just change that to sockets. It's more clear. Um, so, and receive as well, we, we should probably change. Okay, um, so now the function um, A is a bit more clear, B, uh, we've re removed a lot of the cruft, like the, that timeout nonsense and the count variable, uh, and, and C, we, we've simplified the logic of this. Um, right, so what it's doing now is it's, we're calling select and giving it a 10 second timeout under the assumption that if you don't get data in 10 seconds from either side, then you can rest assured that the 
both sides are done sending data. You know, this is HTTP requests, so they come in spurts. Um, and, you know, if you get 10 seconds without any data, you're probably done. Um, so that's why we say if there's no data but something is reported as readable, then just return. Um, otherwise, we just keep sending all of the data to the you know each of the destinations either the client or the server uh, and we stay in this loop if anything throws a, it raises an exception then uh, we break out obviously but we also close the sockets uh, so we're not leaking f file descriptors um, <clears throat> so let's just make sure one last final time that we haven't broken anything so I'll start the proxy again and at least it starts. Let's get Google. Okay. Once, twice, and I'm happy with that. Let's do it one more time just to be sure. Yep. Okay. So um, everything still works. And, uh, you know, we, we have now refactored the implementation quite a bit. Um, one thing that's that will be useful is for you to look at the finished version of proxy.py, which I have here, um, and we'll commit to the GitHub repository, and the original version, look at them side by side, uh, see all the changes we made, and see how more readable the new version is, and how more clear the new version is in what it's doing at each step. Um, I think you know, if we were to do this from scratch, which we'll actually do in video four, we may have designed this a different way. But given the fact that we had a working implementation and we just wanted to clean it up, which is a very common situation, uh, you know, we I think we did the best that we could here. So um, that's all for video three. As I said, this will all be uh, on GitHub and the URL for the repository will be in the comments on YouTube. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment on YouTube or email me at jeff at jeffnup.com. And until next time, this is Jeff Nup from the Writing Idiomatic Python video series. Thank you.